Hey, fantastic Negrito. Thanks so much for joining us on, on WTOP. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, what, a, what a pleasure to be here and to be heard. Awesome. Well, you're coming to 930 Club in D.C. on Wednesday, June 22nd. Uh, have you ever played 930 Club before? I mean, it's a pretty legendary spot here here in the nation's capital. I haven't, but I have a lot of roots in D.C. from the, my family in Virginia and, of course, Bob Boylan. Wait, what? where in Virginia? What family? Well, uh, my entire new album, White Jesus, Black Problems, is based on a story I found seven generations ago in my ancestry archives in Southern Virginia, a small town called Nathalie, but is where my people moved to. But they, the story happened in Amelia County, Virginia. And that's what the whole new album is based on, that story, White Jesus, Black Problems. Yeah, tell me more about that, because I assume that's a lot what we're going to hear at 930 Club. Um, tell me more about it. It's, yeah. it's about your seventh generation grandmother, the whole, you know, tell me about the whole indentured servant, married, the enslaved man. Tell me the whole thing. Well, I don't think they were allowed to get married. I think they were right. sneaking around in, <laughs> in the 1750s, a white Scottish grandmother, that's my grandmother, and a black enslaved man, my grandfather, they hooked it up and seven generations later, Puyaka. <laughs> oh yeah here we have you coming to 9 30 club <laughs> awesome I well think that, i think that's why they did it they 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 had the foresight they said seven generations from now there's going to be an audience in dc that wants to come here <laughs> that's funny yeah. but no in, in all seriousness though what you know talk about sort of the those fa deep family ancestral themes and and why what you know how, how it sparked the whole album for you well it just, I, I was just super inspired. I, I was amazed that here were two people from two different sides of the spectrum, two different sides of the world. One is basically going to be free in seven years, free, white and a woman, and one is a black enslaved man, but they seem like they got something done. And I kept saying that, man, like we live in this era where people can't get anything done because, you know, this side believes this and this side believes that. And we're so entrenched and we, you know, buckle down the hatch and we don't get anything done. So yeah. I really inspired that these two people got an illegal baby done. Right, Good right. Job. Openly, openly defying what were, let's just call it what it is, racist laws of 1750s yeah, colon sure. colonial Virginia. And it's it's so funny because, uh, or I guess not funny, but fascinating that, you know, Virginia, you know, after this would would become you know capital of the confederacy but also right. it would it would also become uh the home of the loving versus virginia ruling with interracial marriage like it there's this push pull going on in the state of virginia the whole time and here your 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 album's telling a whole other story sort of along the same lines it's a fascinating time in history yeah it's a fascinating time and i think maybe there's just something in the water in virginia <laughs> i mean people maybe overlook virginia but i think that um it is extremely inspiring, but honest and truthful. And I felt like it really needed, um, you know, just the title of my album, I'm catching some heat for it, which is okay, I like heat. And I think that it's good to, I need to represent that story in the most bombastic, gregarious, amazing and powerful and shocking way that I could. So I, you know, that title just came to me. I was like, wow, this is so what it is. Here it is, a white woman challenging white supremacy. It's, I'm like, yeah, right. It's it, in the most in the most sincerest way that you can by you know connecting with a black enslaved man. It's just unbelievable courage and poise and um, all the all the good words, perseverance and defiance and everything that I stand for. So I felt like it made sense that I'm re related to these people. I love it. It's a fascinating story. And I don't know if you did that on purpose by saying there's something in the water in Virginia, because, you know, that's for, that's the name of Pharrell, who's from Virginia. He started the he, he's doing a festival this weekend um, on Capitol Hill in D.C. called the Something in the Water Festival. So I, I didn't, you know didn't even know that. <laughs> I, think I met Pharrell once at a Temple of the Dog concert. Because I opened for Temple of the Dog and I think. LA and he, he was there backstage. So I met him once. 
Wow. Wow. That's cool. Well, cool. Well, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, seven generations ago of your family's history and ancestry, but tell me, tell, remind our listeners a little bit more about your, your own life story. You know, I know you're born in Massachusetts and moved out to Oakland. How'd you get into music? Did I read you taught yourself listening to Prince and then, you know, slipping into a couple of classrooms at UC Berkeley, even though you weren't enrolled or <laughs> tell me about your, how you learned. Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, I just, um, I discovered Prince at a very young age in the 80s. And I thought, wow, this, this is a brother that's doing something different. <laughs> and I thought I, was going, I could do something different. He was very inspiring when it came to that. And I did sneak into the University of California, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, to learn how to play. I was in a pretty rough neighborhood and there weren't any pianos around. So I just I snuck in and just pretended to be a student. I had sideburns too when I was like 16, so 17. <laughs> I looked the part. They should name those those practice rooms after me. They should. They should. You were. It was your unofficial. You were auditing the classrooms. You know what I mean. You were just. You were just checking it out. Uh, well, it worked out. I know. Um, I know you used to. You're. You had a previous. You know, moniker, a name. Yeah, it used to be. It was Xavier for that first album, X Factor '96 on Interscope. Um, tell us a, sort of that journey between the Xavier days. And then I know there was like a near fatal car crash in like three weeks in a coma or something. And you ultimately came yeah. out of it. You came out of it with a new name and label for fantastic Negrito in 2014. Well, I think the guy in his twenties, you know, I wanted to be famous and, um, wanted to live like a rock star and have all the finest things that I thought were fine. The best cars, the hottest women, the best drugs, the biggest houses, the best clothing, the best of the best living. The but, best you know, side burns. I, <laughs> you think you want all that stuff in your 20s. And I think, um, you know, after I lived life and failed a bunch of times and, you know, lost my playing hand, as you can see. Is that from the car accident, you mean? Yeah, from a car accident, being in a coma. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see the, the right. scar right there. Yeah. Yeah, right here. You see that. Man. And I, um, yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't really move. I play the guitar with my fingers. Whoa their finger guitar player. So what happens, I think, is I became a middle-aged guy and I just didn't want anything anymore. And it was a lot of power in not wanting to be famous or write some kind of popular hit song. And I just started doing it because it helped relieve my stress level as I was a new parent. And I just got married on a fluke. I was like, all right, I'll try getting married. I didn't really mean to do it, but <laughs> it happened and I'm still married. Thank God, thank God, I'm still married, but. Congratulations. Yeah, I, I just, I got on a plane and got married in another country. So what happened is, um, yeah, it's amazing when you're not looking for that same stuff. So I became a middle-aged guy, just ranting and raving in the uh, train stations of the Bay Area and playing in front of coffee shops and not caring. Man, there is a power for an artist when they stop caring. Right. And, and that's what happened. And then I was very surprised that, people were interested in what I'm doing. I'm still surprised because it is somewhat off. I don't ever fit anywhere. They're like, it's contemporary blues, but I think the blues people hate me. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, it's rock, it's fun. I don't, I don't fit anywhere. And um, it's okay though, I, that's perfect. I came from Elizabeth Gallimore and Grandfather Courage. So that's, I came right. from those people who didn't want to fit in. Right. They didn't fit into someone's repressed fantasy of the world. And I'm really pleased and happy and proud of that. Yeah, they didn't care what people thought and neither, neither do you. And it's funny, like you're saying, you a, a weight lifts off of you when you stop caring what people think and you start doing your best creative creative work. Um, well, real cool, real quick. Um, I know we got to remind people you've won three Grammys so far. Um, there's probably many more to come, but take me back to that very first one for best contemporary blues album. It was last days of Oakland in 2016. Uh, any memories of either putting the album together or what being their Grammy night? Yeah, just the album. I just did the album that I wanted to do without boundaries, without worrying about genres or fitting. And I just didn't, I just, I was just surprised. I'm like, Oh really? Okay. Then you want it. You just, I try to practice gratitude about everything, no matter just sitting here with you, it's just gratitude is always my attitude. I'm grateful for everything that happens, even the bad things, because, you know, you learn the most off of that. And um, I'm happy to accept the Grammy if someone wants to give it to me. And <laughs> I celebrated for a day and I just put it in the box. Yeah. The way it's not something I want to look at. 
I just want to continue being an artist and um, expression, artistry, digging deep and trying to tell the stories of, of the world and of the neighborhoods. Yeah. And you, you, you put it in a box, but then uh, probably because you knew you were going to win again, because you, <laughs> you, you won again. Uh, Please Don't Be Dead in 2018. Um, how do you think you had evolved from Last Days of Oakland to Please Don't Be Dead? Like, are you still maturing, still growing, getting better? I just try to be um, nothing. <laughs> I just try to be nothing. I try to do just nothing when I go into the studio, go get inspired try to be nothing just be connect with that energy that made you an artist that um when you were 17 it's like to me it's like when i get in the studio i feel like a 17 year old and a grandfather all in one <laughs> wisdom of grandpa but freedom of the 17 year old and that's what i try to do on every album and tell a story that may be important to people and that's important to me try to contribute something and that's what matters to me more than anything is body of work and what I've done I think it's the freedom of being a middle-aged artist yeah and living on a farm it's just you just want to just do something great and the chips will fall where they fall wisdom of a grandfather and freedom of a 70 year old I love that that's a that's a your autobiography title right it's there a powerful combination uh yeah absolutely and uh we wait real quick you mentioned you're living on a farm where's that at Oh, in Oakland, I live on a farm. Got you know, grow a lot of veggies and got about fifteen chickens. And I love it. Oh, me too. It's you know, it's better than prescription pills. I mean, it's <laughs> just feel at peace and at one with uh, the soil, the trees, and you know that you're just a guest on this earth. Take care of the best that you can. Yeah, exactly. Na mother, mother nature's drugs right from the soil, baby. Um, well, very hey, cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, well uh and just to round it out just so i have it here you win the third one grammy for have you lost your mind yet you say it's all about each one you're trying to tell a story what what story are you trying to tell and have you lost your mind yet well that comes out in 2020 which was the year of george yeah, Floyd. it was the year of the pandemic i mean we were all losing our minds <laughs> I, I think that's the story i think it had to do a lot with mental health that album mm -hmm. it just so happened that we were all going through something i'm like oh there i go yeah and I, 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 I like to keep my finger on the pulse of things. And then as a, I feel like an elder in society, kind of, I try to like, you know, impart something or contribute something that maybe I like what it's useful. I don't know if I like, if I make music for people to like, but I, I, I make music for people to think. Yeah. That's the stuff that I'm into. So if it gets something going, even if people don't like it, I, I, you know, I'm reading posts about people not liking liking the title of why Jesus Black Problems, but I think it's okay. They can yell at me and then I could be nice and then maybe they learn something like, hey, it's okay if you disagree with me that we don't have to hurl insults or hate each other yeah. or go to war against each other just because we disagree about yeah. a few. Yeah. Well, what, what, what do they say that they don't like about the title? I mean, because because so hate, hate to break it to them, Jesus, uh, the historical Jesus, his skin color was darker than mine. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think uh, they. I think the argument that I get is that they think I'm trying to put down white people to put to bring up black people. I don't get that argument because story has nothing to do with that. The story is about right. the interracial couple. Maybe right. the title is doing exactly what I needed to. Is hey, get your attention. Maybe you'll watch the film about how beautiful and harmonious two yeah. people can be from two different sides of the globe. So it's okay. I don't mind it. I think. Uh, you know, it means you're saying something. I, I, I really am a huge fan of that. Awesome. I, I'm a huge, I, I love that concept too, man. I, I, I keep doing what you're doing. You know, the haters are going to hate, but just, just don't, yeah, even, talk, don't pay attention hate. to them. <laughs> some people actually answer just to be like, hey, do we have some dialogue. And sometimes yeah. it's not pretty good, actually. That's good. Yeah, it sparked the conversation. But some well, people are just, that's what they're out there for to be. You know, an asshole. Sorry if I can't say that on the air, but ah, they're wow. out there. some people are out there to just project their negativity on the world, and that's there's nothing you can do about that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Just take the high road, stay positive, and keep cranking out yeah. your creativity. Uh, keep stay on the high road, stay positive. 
I love it. Well, people can come see the story you're trying to tell there and start that conversation with of white Jesus black problems and all of your other stuff. Uh, when you're playing at the 930 club, it'll be Wednesday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. So get your tickets now at 930 club dot com you've been very generous thanks for joining us on it looks like you're still you know you got the mask dangling here you're on it looks like you're on a tour bus you're probably so busy we got to let you get back yeah, on the road I'm doing a, a couple hours away from i'm in toronto and i'm getting ready to play a festival all right well good luck with the festival and then all the way to toronto then you're gonna come all the way down to dc man the the life of the road right <laughs> yeah, brooklyn new york philadelphia dc it's on all right. Well, we can't wait to, to see you down here um, on Wednesday. So, hey, fantastic Negrita. Thanks so much for joining us. This is awesome.